Psych Social is great for flashcards, Anki, things like that. And um, I think the more you familiarize yourself with these terms, think about examples and scenarios and things like that, the better you'll do. Dorothy back for another episode of the MCAT podcast. How are you doing today? Great. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm doing excellent. We are going through PsychSoch on Blueprint MCAT Full Length 1, which everyone gets for free by signing up for a free account over at blueprintmcat.com. You are one of the amazing live online instructors, and you're sharing your wisdom here with us for these last couple <laughs> of weeks, and we're going to continue today uh, going into a set of discrete questions. When you're yeah. taking the MCAT, how how uh, kind of tuned in are you to, to knowing, as soon as I click that next button, I'm going to a set of discretes? Or do you click the button and go, oh, I'm on discretes now? <laughs> Sometimes it comes a passage um, earlier or later than I'm expecting, but usually it's about two to three passages before you get to your set of discretes. And if you take enough full lengths, you kind of get a sense for when they come around. So mm. I believe it's usually two passages at the beginning before your discretes, and then it's I think another two before you hit the second set and then maybe three before you hit the third set and then two more and then the last set comes around. And so it's usually about two to three passages, but hopefully after two or three, you're ready for some discretes. Kind of, yeah. I call them a brain break, but they're really not a brain <laughs> break. <laughs> but it's just a break from reading a ton and having to synthesize passage information as well. Yeah. As you go into a set of discretes, what do you recommend students do? Because there is that break in terms of needing to read a passage, but mm -hmm. the questions are still there, obviously. Right. Uh, what do you recommend in terms of students attacking the discrete sections? Yeah. So again, cleanse your palate, but also all the information that you need in order to ans answer the question is in the question stem. And then from there, you kind of have to think about what outside content knowledge it might be testing. So sometimes they're purely discrete in the sense that they're asking a question and you just have to figure out what concept is relevant and bring that in and apply it. Sometimes there'll be a little bit more reasoning with the question stem itself. You kind of have to use some of that information in order to answer the question as well. But essentially it's a standalone question, right? So you have to figure out what it's asking you and figure out what you need in order to answer it. Yeah. Oh boy. All right, let's go ahead and jump in and see if we can uh, get a perfect score here on, on these discrete. <laughs> so I'll start with this first one. Question 27, a psychologist assessing the willingness of subjects to spend a full weekend volunteering to clean up a local part decides to measure the effect on uh, of the foot in the door technique. Which of the following would be a way to use this technique? A, ask subjects to first sign a petition in favor of cleaning up the park. B, tell the subjects that their next door neighbor has already agreed to volunteer uh, to clean up the park. C, ask the subjects to recall the last time they personally made use of the park. Or D, remind the subjects that as a member of the community, one of their civic duties is helping to maintain public spaces. So this is really interesting. And I don't know if I learned this from doing the MCAT podcast or reading a very specific book that I can think of off the top of my head um, called Influence. Mm. And the foot in the door technique is basically having people, if I remember correctly, having people do little things that get them to say yes. Um, and then you're like, ha ha, you've said yes enough that I know you're going <laughs> to now do this thing. And so I've got you now. <laughs> exactly. Answer choice A is the only one that really does this of saying, hey, can you sign this petition? You are then saying, yes, I agree that we need to clean up the park. And yes, I'm saying yes to you. And now yes is my obvious answer to when you ask me that uh, if I can help this weekend. Absolutely. Yeah. I think signing petitions is, an, is kind of a classic example of this foot in the door technique because we'll get you riled up and interested in this topic or movement or whatever it is. Get your name on paper so that you might be more likely to donate or spend your time or money for that cause in the future. And so, yeah, get them to agree to a smaller commitment first and then build it up to a larger one. Yes. Love it. All right. <laughs> Reading for the win. I'm pretty sure I read that in a book. Um <laughs> I, I, I like it. I like it. All right. Question 28. Why don't you go ahead with that one? All right. 
In a study about attitudes towards higher education, four subjects are asked to rank the relative importance of higher education. All four participants rank higher education as very important or extremely important on the survey. Which of the following participants is most likely to experience cognitive dissonance as a part of this response? So we're talking about cognitive dissonance here. A, a master electrician who has significant advanced on the job training, but no degree. B, a day laborer whose own education stopped at seventh grade and whose family includes no one who has attended any college. C, a high school math teacher who encouraged his own son to skip college and focus on learning a trade to save all that wasted tuition money. <laughs> And then D, a university professor with two doctoral degrees who has actively advocated for significant reform in the country's higher education system. Four subjects are asked to rank the relative importance of higher education. All four participants rank higher education as very important or extremely important on the survey. Which of the following participants is most likely? Okay, so cognitive dissonance here is is meaning which which person, even though they said higher education is very important or extremely important, doesn't actually think that. Um, that <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, I'm I'm saying that now, uh, or I'm I'm rephrasing that appropriately. Yeah, absolutely. So if we look at master electrician, that one jumps out as an obvious one, right? We have a, a master electrician. You have to assume that uh, a master electrician is doing well, enjoys their job potentially. Uh, they're a master electrician, and so they're 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 doing well with no degree. So mm -hmm. that one seems like an obvious one, but I'm, I'm put that aside. A day laborer, you would assume A and B are similar, uh, but a day laborer means like you're struggling, right? You're just working right. day by day. You don't have a good career at like a master electrician. You don't have a trade that you can fall back on. Uh, and so A and B are very different, even though they're very similar. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to throw B out. Good. C, a high school math teacher who, who encouraged his own son to skip college to save all that wasted tuition money. <sighs> Uh, this one is weird because you assume a high school math teacher understands the importance of education. Um, <laughs> but the save all that wasted tuition money doesn't say that higher education isn't, isn't important. It just says tuition it's is very expensive. expensive. Right. Um, so I'm going to throw C out because it's, it's focusing on the wrong thing there. Save all that wasted tuition money versus if it said focus on learning a trade to because uh, higher education isn't important, all right? If it gave me that specific answer. Uh, answer choice D obviously is is not the right answer here. So I'm gonna go with A as, as the right answer. Okay, it's actually not A. Darn it. Do you have a second guess? <laughs> <sighs> My second guess would be C because I maybe just thought about that save all the wasted tuition money incorrectly. I think it, we could shift it a little bit. So cognitive dissonance is essentially a feeling discomfort where you have t inconsistencies between your beliefs and your actions. So mm -hmm. we're looking for contradiction here. They have one belief, but they also have another belief. And those two beliefs are at war with each other. Okay. And so with C, a high school math teacher who um, encourages his own son to kind of skip out on college because it's not worth the money essentially, but then they still rank higher education as super important. That's a contradiction there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the thing with a, a master electrician who has significant advanced on the job training, but no degree, they might just never had the opportunity to actually go and get the degree. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there's no dissonance in thinking a college degree is important. Just they weren't able to get one. It worked out that they were able to find a career that had the training on the job rather than in the format in the form of higher education. It's a trick question. <laughs> Tricky question, for sure. <laughs> okay. So when when you talk about the that cognitive dissonance of, of like a contradiction, answer choice D seems like it would be one that a lot of students might pick because there's this university professor who's saying there needs to be significant reform. And so how is that not the right answer there? Yeah, so we don't really know what type of reform the professor is advocating for. So we can't really say that wanting reform in the higher education system is necessarily at odds with the idea that 
higher education is important. Maybe they think it's important, but they are trying to just improve some aspects of it. And so that's not necessarily at odds. They are also a university professor, so they are working within higher education as well. And so it's probably not the best candidate for distance because we don't have enough information okay. um, to necessitate contradiction there. All right. So if you're allowed two chances on the MCAT, I would have gotten that one right. Uh, let me mark that one. Um, answer choice 29. Poor prenatal nutrition for mothers can lead to delayed cognitive development in children. Poor prenatal nutrition is correlated with lower socioeconomic status. A child born to a mother in which of the following neighborhoods is most likely to fall behind in elementary school? A, a neighborhood with large close-knit groups of extended families. B, a neighborhood with high levels of violent street crime. C, a neighborhood in which individual homes are widely separated. Or D, a neighborhood with no racial diversity. Ooh. All right, so... We know that poor nutrition for mothers leads to delayed cognitive development and poor prenatal nutrition is correlated with lower socioeconomic status. So I think the question is asking us which of these scenarios portrays lower socioeconomic status. I think. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so large close-knit groups of extended families I don't know if socioeconomic status is really related to that. Um, I'm going to skip B for now. Answer choice C, homes are widely separated. To me, seems like higher socioeconomic status, unless we're talking like super rural. Um, right. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to throw C out. Uh, and D, a neighborhood with no racial diversity. Um, I don't know if that, particular portrays any significance there for socioeconomic status. The only one really to me is the high levels of violent street crime. Um, we know that socioeconomic status and, and crime kind of go hand in hand. Right. So I'm going to go with answer choice B. And you'd be correct. Yeah. So out of all of these, crime is the most closely linked to lower socioeconomic status. And the others are kind of either out of scope or opposite of what we're looking for here yeah okay all right question 30 all right casinos maximize the amount of money that people are willing to put into slot machines by making sure that the slot machines pay out jackpots on a reinforcement schedule that is the most resistant to be behavior extinction these machines use which reinforcement schedule <laughs> <laughs> oh this is the old uh <laughs> uh, the old variable interv uh, interval answer here. I'm pretty sure it's a variable interval. It's variable something. It's oh, is, is it variable ratio? <laughs> Darn it! It is variable ratio. Darn it. So, <laughs> um, do you know the difference between variable ratio and variable interval? Obviously not. Okay, <laughs> so interval deal deals with time period. So it's like after every five minutes, like, so if it's a fixed interval, it's saying every five minutes you get a payout. Mm. Variable interval is like, hey, it might be five minutes, it might be 15, it might be 20, whatever, however long it takes, you never know. And that's what kind of keeps the behavior from going extinct. However, variable ratio is more relevant here because it's based on um, the number of times something oh, okay. happens rather than an amount of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so time yeah. versus action. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so might be three spins of the, the slot, might be 20, might be six, yeah. might be, yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right, <laughs> that, that's just standard, uh, standard reinforcement kind Schedules, of psychology. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> fixed ratio, what does that look like? So like every fifth pull, you're going to hit the jackpot. And obviously that's not yep. going to help casinos make any money. Where, where would right. fixed ratio come into play? Um, yeah, so kind of like when you're making, maybe if you're a factory worker and you get a reward after every hundred mm. shoes that you make or something like that. So it leads to a high response rate because you're getting to that next hundred mark. Mm -hmm. But there's some pauses in behavioral um, kind of, it's not quite as res resistant to extinction because people know the number of things they have to do in order to get that reward. Yeah. yeah. And then continuous is pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Like, every, every single time. Every get. time. It's like, 
Yeah. So continuous re- reinforcement is great for teaching someone a new thing. So we often give dogs treats to roll over or to sit when we're first training them. So it's the quickest way to teach someone a new behavior. But when we talk about intermittent or partial reinforcement schedules, we're more talking about how do we keep them from forgetting that behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. And so I think oh, I, I went 50% here. That's not, that's not good enough for discretes. Discretes, we need to, <laughs> we need to get these, these questions right. So we finished a set of discretes. Again, cleansing the palate before we move on to, to our next one. Uh, any, any final words of wisdom here before we end this one? Psych Search is all about definitions and being familiar with terminology. So this, Psych Search is great for flashcards, Anki, things like that. And um, I think the more you familiarize yourself with these terms, think about examples and scenarios and things like that, the better you'll do on this section.